he says under the Constitution and Bill of Rights, should be decided in favor of liberty. And Marshall believed that such cases should be decided with deference to the will of the majority. Madison feared the tyranny of the majority, and Marshall feared the likelihood that a broad press right would foment sedition and rebellion. The pushback, and there was pushback against the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions, was so intense that Madison, who'd helped author the Virginia resolution, agreed to run for the House of Delegates to publicly support the Virginia resolution. The Virginia House of Delegates in their 1799-1800 session joined Madison in clarifying the legal and policy arguments that supported the Virginia resolution and to respond to Federalist mixed characterization of those arguments. Madison became the leader and the primary draftsman of the Virginia report clarifying the meaning of the Virginia resolution. The Virginia report opened by strongly affirming the Assembly's firm resolution to defend the Constitution of the United States and the Virginia Constitution against every aggression, either foreign or domestic, and that they will support the government of the United States in all measures warranted by the Constitution of the United States. The resolutions were not intended to be incendiary. They were simply reminders that the legislative, executive, and judicial branches of government should maintain their resolve to support the Constitution and the natural rights secured therein." End quote. The second and third resolutions in the Virginia report made it clear that the Commonwealth of Virginia would, quote, watch over and oppose every infraction of those constitutional principles which constitute the only basis of that union. The third resolution in the report was perhaps the most controversial. It provided that the states had a duty, quote, to interpose for arresting the progress of the evil, the Sedition Act, and form and maintain within Virginia the authorities, rights, and liberties appertaining to them. The report added, quote, in all contemporary discussions and comments which the Constitution underwent, the Constitution was constantly justified and recommended on the ground that the powers not given to the government were withheld from it, a reference to the Tenth uh, Amendment. Uh, States, uh, in his view, it, it, Madison's view, were largely defined as the parties to the ratification of the compact or constitution through the vote of the electorate and the selection of uh, delegates to the ratifying convention. He believed, and Madison did, in his Virginia report that it was necessary to clarify what was meant by interposition. And as to that, he declared, uh, Quote, the states then, being parties to the constitutional compact and in their sovereign capacity, it follows of necessity that there can be no tribunal above their authority to decide in the last resort whether the compact was made by them, uh, whether the compact made by them be violated and consequently that as the parties to it, they must themselves decide in the last resort such questions as may be of sufficient magnitude to require interposition. He then added, it does not follow, however, because the states as sovereign parties to their constitutional compact must ultimately decide whether it has been violated that such a decision ought to be interposed in either in a hasty manner or on doubtful or inferior occasions. The breach must be both willful and material to justify application of the rule. In a final effort to clarify the intent, the report added, quote, but in the case of an intimate and constitutional union like the United States, it is evident that the interposition of the parties in their sovereign capacities can be called for by occasions only deeply and essentially affecting the vital principles of their political sense system. Um, so it was largely, he viewed the 
uh, and I'm again going to skip some of the things that are in the paper, that it was, that interposition was uh, an act to be taken quite seriously and primarily in the promotion of liberty. Uh, the final sentences of the report could, should be emphasized. Quote, it cannot be forgotten that among the arguments addressed to those who apprehended danger to liberty from the establishment of the general government over so great a country, the appeal was emphatically made to the intermediate existence of the state governments between the people and that government, to the vigilance with which they would descry the first symptoms of usurpation, and to the promptitude with which they would sound the alarm to the public. The Virginia resolution, and that's the end of that quote, the Virginia resolution is clarified in the report was intended to descry or catch the sight of, sound an alarm to the public, and assist in the interpretation of the Constitution. It was not intended as a declaration of the omnipotence of uh, state power as a constitutional matter. The Virginia Resolution as such was just that, a resolution, a tactic familiar to Madison from the time of his successful memorial and remonstrance, an effective means of raising an alarm when liberty was being infringed. It was also intended as an interpretive aid to those serving the national government, particularly the judiciary, but also other members of branches that it might remind them of their constitutional responsibilities. Madison's painstaking effort to explain the Virginia Resolution in the report also revealed his theory of constitutional interpretations. Interpretation. It was largely the view that in difficult cases involving natural rights, such as the freedom of the press or the balance of power between states and national government, all who had taken the oath to support the Constitution should protect rights rather than deferring to the majority. Federalism, like so much of the Constitution, was designed to protect the balance of power between the national and the state governments and to ensure the perpetuation of a union conceived in liberty. The Sedition Act was ultimately ineffectual. In the end, the nation accepted the arguments of the Virginia Resolution. When Jefferson became president, the Federalists were more than happy to provide, to uh, take advantage of a free press and attack the Jefferson uh, administration. Let me jump from that period to the end of Madison's life. Years later, on December 19, 1828, a dispute arose regarding the tariff power, and Vice President John Calhoun was a vocal opponent of the tariff on constitutional grounds. The South, his resolution, the South Exposition and Protest, was introduced in the South Carolina House of Representatives. Calhoun's exposition purportedly drew on the nullification and in interposition arguments raised in the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions, which he used to defend the right of the states to nullify acts of the national government they believed to be unconstitutional. That, of course, ultimately contributes or leads to, is a factor leading to the Civil War. Madison felt compelled to respond to Calhoun. On the tariff issue, Madison stressed, quote, the debates contain the most ample proof that manufacturers were as much an object as revenue, that such regulations previously existed in particular states and were looked for from the new Congress, that the power was not questioned by any single member, and that the use of it was expressly proposed, not only by northern members, but particularly by those from Virginia and South Carolina. The people who ratified the Constitution, in short, had accepted that meaning of the tariff power. But more important to Madison was his concern about the expansive way that Calhoun and others were using the principle of nullification and interposition to justify the predominance of state power. In September of 1829, Madison wrote a lengthy defense of his view regarding the tariff interposition and nullification, 
in response to the views espoused by supporters of the nullification, including Governor Giles of Virginia and uh, Calhoun of South Carolina. Fearing a breakup of the union, the very union he and others had worked so hard to establish, Madison adamantly argued, quote, in all the views that may be taken of questions between the state governments and general government, the awful consequences of a final rupture and dissolution of the union should never for a moment be lost sight of. Such a prospect must be deprecated, must be shuddered at by every friend to his country, to liberty, to the happiness of man. He added, quote, for, the, for in the event of a dissolution of the union, an impossibility of ever renewing it is brought home to every mind by the difficulties encountered in establishing it. Madison believed the nation, uh, I'm gonna be good. Madison believed that the nation would devolve into alien, rival, and hostile tribes if nullification was accepted and taken to its logical conclusion. With the ardor of the patriot he was, Madison concluded his letter, let this letter with these memorable words, quote, the happy union of these states is a wonder, their constitution a miracle, their example the hope of liberty throughout the world. Woe to the ambition that would meditate the destruction of either. And he actually added an exclamation point. That's in the <laughs> quote. In that letter, Madison succinctly clarified what he meant by interposition in instances in which the national government exceeds its constitutional powers and threatens liberty. He said, is there no remedy for the usurpation in which the Supreme Court of the, universe, uh, the, of the United States concur? Yes, constitutional remedies such as have been found effectual. So now he's talking about how do we remedy excesses of national power? He goes on and he says, we can do it through three means. One, remonstrances and instructions. Resolutions, like the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions. Second, recurring elections and impeachments. And third, amendment of the Constitution. Each of these three forms of interposition, while effectual in securing the proper balance between the state and national government, are a far cry from nullification. In a letter dated March 12, 1833 to William Rives, one of Madison's early and most able biographers and friend, and a friend, Madison reiterated his support for the supremacy clause, something that he had talked about in Federalist 44. He said, the words of the Constitution are explicit, that the Constitution and laws of the United States shall be supreme over the Constitution and laws of the several states supreme in their exposition and execution as well as in their authority. Without a supremacy in those respects, it would be like a scabbard in the hands of a soldier without a sword in it." End quote. Realizing that the Union and liberty were at stake in such matters as evidenced by the nullification movement, Madison then powerfully reasserted the essence of his view of constitutional interpretation. Quote, it is but too common to read the expressions of a remote period through the modern meaning of them and to admit guards against misconstruction not anticipated. A few words with a prophetic gift might have prevented much error in the glosses on those proceedings, end quote. Madison emphasized that the pernicious errors in interpretation invariably attend reading the words of the document through modern lenses through a modern lens, rather than resorting to the interpretation of those words in light of the times and context in which they were expressed. In other words, their public meaning at the time of ratification. For Madison, the coexistence of liberty and union and the union of the states demanded allegiance to the Constitution and its principles, even when they were against one's personal interests. As Madison neared his death, he recognized that the rising generation particularly within the South and in his native state, the Commonwealth of Virginia, viewed his views, his position to be archaic and anachronistic. They believed the Constitution should be read 
independently by them for their own day. This kind of arrogance was ultimately employed to justify the generation following Madison and their willingness to engage in a bloody civil war. Charles Ingersoll, who is credited with first declaring Madison to be the father of the Constitution, was Madison's final formal visitor visiting just days before Madison's death. In that meeting, Madison decried once again nullification again talked about the importance of interposition, that the states would support their balance, but not that independent sovereignty that could lead to nullification. In all that, he feared that the liberty of the Union what, that was being held together so tenuously uh, was in severe jeopardy. At Madison's death, John Quincy Adams closed his two-hour long eulogy with these words, quote, the voice that steals, stills the raging of the waves and the tumults of the people that spoke the words of peace, of harmony, of union. And for that voice, may you and your children's children to the last syllable of recorded time fix your eyes upon the memory and listen with your ears to the life of James Madison, end quote. When we listen to what that still small voice, when we listen to that still small voice, we understand that federalism, the carefully calibrated balance between state and federal power, secures liberty and union. When the states were too powerful, Madison argued for limiting their power. When the national government exceeded its constitutional bounds, Madison argued that the balance be recalibrated in the interests of liberty. He also outlined how states can best interpose their rightful power when the national government exceeds its constitutional bounds. Maybe it's time we listened again to Madison. Uh, I wanted to uh, thank you all for coming. I'm delighted to be here. I'm grateful for the organizers of this conference, Rod and his team, uh, especially uh, Carl and Katrina. Um, I'll get this started on the right one here. I'm also grateful to be sharing this, uh, this panel with some great scholars, uh, scholars who I admire and I enjoy their work. Uh, Katrina. Can you do the log in? I wanted to start just by giving you a little bit of uh, my interest in federalism, where it comes from. Uh, first, I consider myself a product of the American West, and so I'm going to talk in a moment about why I think the West has such a unique uh, and important uh, role in the development of federalism. Uh, and also, I wanted to share with you um, some of the research I've been doing, uh, my background's in constitutional history. Uh, and when I was at the beginning of my studies, uh, there was a Supreme Court case that came out uh, called Bond v. United States. Uh, and I wish we had time to get into the facts of Bond. They're fascinating. It would make for a great ABC drama. Um, <laughs> but in the interest of time, I'll just tell you what the issue was in that case. The issue was uh, whether um, an individual citizen of the United States has standing, has the right to bring a claim under the Tenth Amendment. Uh, and so th that was the question. Or uh, the alternative theory would be that the only people able to bring claims under the Tenth Amendment were states, not people at all, states qua states. Um, and so uh, in this case, the Supreme Court decided uh, nine to zero that an individual did have standing to bring a claim. And in that case, Justice Kennedy wrote the opinion and he wrote what I like to call the ode to federalism where he uh, listed all these wonderful things about federalism. 
He said, the allocation of powers between the national government and the states enhances freedom. Uh, federalism secures to the citizens the liberties that derive from the diffusion of sovereign power by denying any one government complete jurisdiction. Uh, federalism protects the liberty of the individual from arbitrary power. An individual has a direct interest in objecting to laws that upset that constitutional balance. Uh, and this is a great theory uh, of federalism and it's very appealing because uh, the idea is that even if the rights that we mention in the Bill of Rights end up being watered down or misinterpreted, that there's still structural protection for uh, individual liberty. Uh, to give you uh, an example of how this might work, in, an, in a case in the early 2000s uh, called Kelo, the Supreme Court adopted an interpretation of a provision of the Fifth Amendment that was very deferential to government power and uh, not so solicitous of individual rights, uh, individual property rights. Um, it's the subject of a recent movie called Little Pink House. Uh, and as we all know, books are always better than the movie. So if you want to read the book, you can read The Grasping Hand by my uh, co-panelist here. Um, there was a reaction to Kilo at the state level. And I was practicing law at the time. And we had a takings case that ha happened to be in the Supreme Court at the time. And there was a reaction by state legislatures and state Supreme Courts against uh, what the Supreme Court had done. So in the end, there may have been a beefing up at, of property rights at the state level, at least in some states. That's why it's such an appealing theory. And this is what set me off in wanting to investigate uh, federalism more fully. Um, so there was one other thing that Justice Kennedy said in his uh, there's a little pink house, so suddenly we're here. We have a few of uh, the Tenth Amendment, I think Paul mentioned it's a mere truism. So uh, during Justice Kennedy's Ode to Federalism, he said one thing that intrigued me. He said the framers concluded that the allocation of powers between the national government and the state uh, the states enhances freedom. And I became curious about this statement because you'll notice this is a historical claim, right? Uh, this is something like an originalist claim about what federalism is. Uh, so I started off looking at this question. I'm not going to talk about it today because others have, but it set me off on uh, a journey of researching how federalism evolved after the founding. Um, I believe that America's favorite pastime is not actually baseball, it's arguing the contours of federalism, where the boundary lies. So <laughs> let's not think that the federalism was just set in 1787. Uh, the contest went on. They went on over whether we can have a national bank, whether Congress can ban slavery in the territories, whether uh, the New Deal was constitutional, and they go on today. Uh, and so my research area is in the, in the long 19th century and the question that I'm interested in is, how did others in that time frame view federalism? What did they think, uh, where did, would they put the proper boundaries uh, between uh, the national government and the states? Uh, and the main question is, are we being faithful to our constitutional structure in law and policy? Uh, which raises the question of, what is our constitutional structure? And history has a lot to say about that. Um, so the evolution of American federalism includes, I think, the accumulation of power in the national government over time. Often that sovereign power had been previously exercised by other sovereigns like states or tribes. Uh, and the story of how that sovereign power moves from one entity to another is often told in the United States on what I'd call a north-south axis, right? Uh, people talk about it in terms of slavery and civil war, uh, segregation, desegregation, civil rights. Um, these are important histories. Uh, the Civil War was, after all, the uh, bloodiest war in American history. And the long civil rights movement may not have achieved the level of success that it did without new theories of federal power. Yet these histories tend to leave out what I think are even more important historical events and processes that have shaped American federalism. And these events played out not between North and South, but uh, from East to West. The accumulation of power resulting from the north-south dichotomy, I think, lay rather dormant after Reconstruction, but that's not to say that federal, 
power was not growing. I think it was, and it was growing primarily because of what the United States was doing in the West. Um, and the story is more complicated when you tell uh, the history of federalism in this way. So on the North-South story, you have heroes. This is Otis Howard. He was a Civil War general. He was a big uh, figure in Reconstruction. Uh, he helped bring freedom to the slave, right? He's also the same general uh, who went and chased Chief Joseph around Idaho and Montana and forced his people onto reservations. So the story's more complicated, the history's more complicated, and I think the history's more enriching if we remember this aspect of history. I'm going to mention briefly a couple of ways in which the federal government altered federalism, the balance of power, as part of westward expansion. Uh, and the first has to do with Native American tribes. So when we think of federalism today, uh, we tend to think in binary terms, which we have a federal government and state governments, and that's it. At the founding, however, federalism in flux entailed <clears throat> many entities and locations of power who vied uh, for allegiance from the people. There was, of course, the new national government. There was the state governments. Uh, there were county governments, which may have preceded their state governments. Uh, there were some ecclesiastical institutions which were established and which had certain kinds of uh, power and demanded allegiance from their people. And, of course, there were Native American tribes. Uh, what did the Constitution have to say about tribes? Uh, not a lot, but it did mention them in a couple of places, uh, mostly in ways in which it recognized the continuing existence of tribal sovereignty. Uh, the Commerce Clause gives Congress power to regulate commerce uh, among the states, but with foreign nations and with uh, the Indian tribes. Later on, the 14th Amendment, which the, this is the first sentence of the 14th Amendment, all persons born or naturalized in the United States are citizens of the United States. Uh, and they included this important caveat and subject to the jurisdiction thereof, which was a nod to continuing tribal sovereignty. So Indians born in the United States uh, were not citizens of the United States through the 14th Amendment. Uh, <clears throat> this uh, recognition of continuing tribal sovereignty began to change uh, in the late uh, 1800s, in the 1870s. Uh, at that time, the national government began to take a stronger interest in regulating uh, Indian affairs, especially Indian on Indian crime, which had previously been left to tribes to regulate themselves. Uh, why was this? I think that the, f the historical factors are really messy and complicated, and at the risk of oversimplification, I'd say that in the wake of the Civil War, there was a growing idea that you could use the power of the federal government to get rid of local peculiar institutions and create a kind of American identity. Uh, so it's during this time that you begin to see these Indian boarding schools pop up whose specific goal was to take uh, Indians and Americanize them and Christianize them. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so there was a growing desire at the national level to prosecute Indians for crimes committed against other Indians. Uh, initially, there was not much appetite for that at the state level. Uh, states and territories were still content to let tribes regulate themselves. Uh, however, one species of Indian on Indian violence began to attract the attention of uh, Anglo-American settlers in states and territories in the 1870s. This is where my, in my research got really interesting. Uh, that violence was the killing of Indian witches by their tribes. So for the most part, uh, white settlers living in Nevada or California were happy to let Indians regulate themselves for an ordinary crime of burglary or murder, but when they started to see the killing of Indian witches, they took a greater interest um, and they started to publicize these accounts of Indian witch killings. Um, so here's one example, um, and you can read hundreds and hundreds of newspaper articles from the late 1800s. Uh, documenting Indian witch killings. These were sensationalized, unlike our news today, uh, because there was this purpose of wanting to now bring in uh, Anglo criminal justice into the tribes, and they succeeded in doing so. Uh, Congress finally passed legislati uh, legislation 1885 
uh, giving the federal government power to regulate Indian on Indian crime. Where did Congress get this power? I don't know, but here's what the Supreme Court said. It said, in the United States, there can only be two sovereigns, national government or state government. So this marks a big switch, I think, from a federalism of multiple sovereigns, and we're now narrowing it down uh, to two, and we're placing all power in these two. Uh, what's the legacy of this history? Uh, American Indian history and law in the 20th century, I think, is even crazier than that of the 19th century. Um, here's what Justice Thomas says about federal Indian policy and how that policy seeps into law. He says, uh, federal Indian policy is schizophrenic. Uh, and this plays up every year in the Supreme Court. It plays out uh, in states, especially here in the West. Uh, there, federal Indian law, Indian law in general, is confusing. It's a patchwork of state law, tribal law, federal law, and the jurisdictional boundaries are not clear, and it's messy. And um, that's the heritage of, I think, failing to speak to spell out specifically where the tribes have fit within the constitutional order. The second area that I wanted to talk about uh, where the federal government has exercised power in the West is in public lands. Um, so to back up uh, just a little bit, before the revolution there was this thing called crown lands in England and as the name suggests the king had basically unfettered power to manage uh, crown lands. He could lease them, he could hunt on them, he could sell them, and that was particularly concerning to the colonists because kings who could sell their land now have a lot of money sitting in the coffers, and what do kings with a lot of money and a lot of time tend to do? They tend to go off and start wars. And so for that reason, uh, when the founders needed to manage federal land, uh, they placed the power to do so not with the executive, uh, but with Congress. And interestingly, um, they placed the power not in Article I, where we find most of Congress's power, uh, but they placed it in Article IV, uh, which is a great article, and it talks about the relationship of the states with each other and with the federal government. Um, this is St. George Tucker. He was an early American legal thinker who expressed this concern about having uh, too much money and power in the hands of the executive, uh, resulting from the sale of land. Uh, despite Tucker's uh, concerns the policy of the United States from the founding through much of the 1800s was uh, to dispose of land for the most part. Uh, so when a territory became a state, uh, it would grant that state some trust lands and then the federal government would take on the role of selling off lands within the state. So you may have heard that phrase, land office business, which developed in the 1800s meant to con 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 continuing uh, uh, and busy business. Uh, so you've no doubt seen, there's the property clause, that's Article 4. You've no doubt seen maps like this, or this one in particular, which demonstrates the ownership of land uh, by the federal government in all the states, and you can see the disparity in the West. You may not be familiar with this picture, um, and I sometimes hesitate to show it because uh, I don't think it, the resolution was exactly right, but what it shows are state trust lands. So these are lands that the federal government granted to the states when they became states. Um, and the blue dots are state trust lands that have uh, restrictions placed on them for use by the federal government. So unlike eastern states, even these state lands uh, have restricted use. You can notice the one state in the west that didn't have any restrictions placed on its use, Nevada, and it ended up selling off most of its state trust lands. Um, there is a common belief, I think, that the federal government does a better job man managing uh, public lands than states would do. I just want to finish with a cautionary tale about that. Uh, when the Congress wanted to create national parks, or large recreation parks for the first time, its initial instinct was not to create a national park, but to take that land and give it to a state. So Yosemite was created initially as a state park. John Muir hated California's management of Yosemite, and he fought a decades-long battle to get the land transferred from California to the national government. His chief antagonist during this um, battle was a guy named John Irish, who was part of the committee in California that managed uh, Yosemite. 
and they fought back and forth and they hated each other and it's fun to read what they wrote about each other. Um, finally, John Muir won and he sent out his celebratory telegrams to all of his friends. We won. I took Teddy Roosevelt on a tour and now we got the land in federal hands. Isn't it wonderful? What was the first thing that the federal government did with Yosemite? They built a huge reservoir right in the middle of it. And John Muir hated this. Right? He felt this was a big betrayal of what he had been working for. I was curious to know what John Irish thought of the reservoir. <laughs> so I went back and did a little research. Um, John Irish hated the reservoir too. He was the California manager. Um, so it's one of those lessons of be careful what you wish for uh, John Muir and be careful if you think that the federal government does the best job in managing lands, whether it be fires or accidentally dumping chemicals into rivers, um, that's not necessarily true. Um, the history is interesting in and of itself. I think it has great implications for to debate, to debates today in political circles and legal argument. And uh, I have some thoughts on where Federalism might be going, but I think there's an opportunity to talk about that later. So I'll conclude here to make sure Pre Professor Somin has some time here. Thank you. I'd like to start by thanking the Center for Constitutional Studies and uh, for organizing this event and all of you for coming. Uh, in my talk, I'm going to be discussing the impact of voting with your feet on the history of American federalism, also often known and described as foot voting. Uh, voting with your feet uh, is choosing where you want to live based on the kinds of government policies that you prefer. And it's a ubiquitous element in American history. Uh, one can do that obviously in a federal system by choosing a state or a locality. Uh, that's going to be my principal focus. But it's also possible to do this in the private sector to some degree with private planned communities and also through international migration. In a very real sense, the United States as a nation is the product of foot voting in that the vast majority of Americans are either themselves immigrants like me or their descendants of people who immigrated to the United States from other countries uh, because they preferred the policies and institutions of the US uh, to those that they left behind. Uh, I'm going to first start off by talking a little about foot voting generally and its potential benefits. Uh, then I'll discuss uh, the relevance of the founding to foot voting. And in the last parts of the presentation, I'll discuss the evolution of foot voting during the 19th and 20th centuries and on into the issues involving foot voting uh, that we face today. Uh, so foot voting, as I mentioned before, is a mode of political decision making uh, where people can use it to choose what sorts of government policies they want to live under. Uh, and it can be distinguished from ballot box voting, the more conventional mechanism of political choice that we tend to think of where if we want to change in government policy, we try to uh, vote out the bastards, throw them out, and then vote in a new set of bastards who hopefully will pursue <laughs> different and better policies. Uh, so uh, foot voting is an alternative mechanism of getting out from under policies that you don't like uh, or going to uh, ones that you prefer. Uh, and it has several potential important advantages. One is foot voting in a federal system can potentially satisfy a wide range of diverse preferences at once. People who prefer one set of government policies, say high taxes and high amounts of government services, can choose to settle in areas which have those policies. People who prefer the opposite can choose different places. Uh, a second is that Foot voting, much more than ballot box voting, empowers the individual. Uh, in all but the very smallest of jurisdictions, the individual ballot box voter is largely powerless. He or she has only one chance in many thousands or many millions of actually casting a vote that's decisive to the outcome of an election. By contrast, with foot voting, uh, the individual has more choice. Uh, if he or she decides to live in a particular location, that choice 
does make a decisive difference. It does decisively affect uh, the policies that they get to live under. Uh, in part because of the fact that foot voting allows an individual to make a decisive choice, it also has important informational advantages. Uh, because the chance that a ballot box vote will affect an electoral outcome or affect government policy is so extremely small, most voters are what economists call rationally ignorant. Uh, that is, it's actually rational for them to pay relatively little attention to government and public policy. Uh, and lots of survey data indicates that that's precisely what they do, that they often don't know even very basic information about what the government is doing, uh, what the policy of different parties are, and so forth. If you're interested in this, I have an entire book about it called Democracy and Political Ignorance. Uh, by contrast, when people uh, vote, at the, uh, vote with their feet, they do actually have much better incentives to consider their options, uh, to seek out relevant information and weigh them carefully. Uh, if you're like most people, uh, you probably spend more time and effort seeking out information the last time you bought a car or a television set or an iPhone than the last time you decided who to vote for for president or for any other political office. That's not because your television set is more important than the presidency or it deals with more complicated issues. It's because you knew that the, the TV set that you chose is actually the one that will end up in your living room, whereas when you flip on the TV and you see the president or you have the misfortune of him seeing him or some other politicians, the chance that your vote can decisively affect who those people are uh, is very, very small. Uh, by contrast, uh, you have a big chance of being able to determine whether you can whether you live in Utah or some other state or what locality you live in, and therefore people tend to take those choices uh, more seriously. Finally, uh, studies by development economists show that Foot voting is a major driver of economic growth and development. It enables people to move to areas where they can be more productive, uh, which in turn historically accounts for a large part of the economic growth that we've experienced in the US uh, and also around the world. Uh, so it can also make people materially better off, both by enriching the foot voters themselves and by increasing their productivity uh, such that the entire economy grows. Uh, so I'll start off uh, now with the overview of foot voting in the history of federalism and look first at the founding. The founding fathers, as you've already heard today, discussed and debated a great many different issues related to federalism. Uh, but interestingly, they had almost nothing to say about foot voting. If you read the Federalist Papers, uh, the debates at the ratifying conventions and so forth, there's almost no discussion uh, of voting with your feet. Uh, despite this, the federal system established at the founding actually created a pretty good environment for foot voting. This is so for several reasons. Most obviously, of course, is that it is a federal system, so there are different states with different policies on various issues which offer foot voters uh, a potential choice. A second is that uh, the federal government created by the Constitution, at least as originally understood and interpreted, uh, at least through the 1930s, actually put fairly tight limits on federal government power. It left a lot of issues up to the states, and therefore a lot of issues uh, could potentially be left up to the choice of foot voters. They had some real uh, options. Also, from the founding through the 1930s, and even by international standards, even today, uh, states had to raise a pretty high percentage of their own revenue themselves from their own taxpayers. Uh, they couldn't rely, for the most part, on the federal government giving them money. And if they have to raise their own funds, that gives them incentive to compete for taxpaying residents uh, and to try to uh, adopt public policies that are attractive to them, which is also beneficial uh, for foot voting. Uh, so uh, a good environment for foot voting, we might say, was a kind of fortunate byproduct of the founding. Uh, it wasn't really what they were aiming for. It wasn't something they thought a lot about, uh, but it was created anyway through the interplay of the way the federal system was set up. 
Uh, and if you look at uh, the development of federalism through the 19th and early 20th centuries, uh, foot voting plays a major role. Lance Sorensen has already discussed some aspects of uh, westward expansion uh, and how it impacted American federalism. Obviously, westward expansion was a major element of foot voting. Uh, many millions of people, both from the eastern states and also immigrants from abroad, moved to new western territories. Some of this movement was just the attraction of free land and natural resources, but some of it also was the result of policies deliberately adopted by the new western states and territories to encourage foot voting. For example, states in, uh, like Wyoming and Utah actually pioneered uh, giving much greater rights to women than was the case in the eastern states. There's among the first states, uh, the first actually to give women to vote and give them various other kinds of equal rights. Uh, they did this uh, because at least early on they had a shortage of women relative to men. Uh, the men who lived in those territories said we, we want to have the opportunity to get married and have children and so forth and the only way you can do that is to uh, make the uh, new state attractive uh, to women. There are also other policies that they adopted to try to attract uh, immigrants both from abroad and also migrants from the eastern uh, United States. Uh, it, uh, the state of Utah is actually a particularly good place to discuss this because, of course, uh, the state of Utah was initially created through an effort at deliberate mass foot voting. It was a, established as a refuge for the Mormons, uh, ha uh, escaping the persecution that they had suffered uh, in the eastern states. Uh, so Utah, in some ways, a particularly dramatic example uh, of uh, foot voting in the U.S. differing from most of the other cases, and it was a mass organized movement as opposed to a relatively uncoordinated one by uh, individuals. Uh, another way in which foot voting impacted uh, 19th century American political constitutional development and the history of federalism is uh, what, what, through the development of slavery. Obviously, slavery is the very opposite of foot voting. The whole point of keeping someone as a slave is that they're not allowed to leave without the master's permission. Despite this, of course, many slaves did try to escape uh, just to fleeing to the northern free states, and this led to the enactment of Fugitive Slave Acts, first the one in 1793, then the much more severe one in 1850. Uh, and the Fugitive Slave Acts and the effort to enforce them led to major conflict between free states and the federal government and between the North and the South. Uh, it definitely exacerbated sectional tensions in various ways uh, and helped precipitate the Civil War. So in this very real sense, the effort by slaves to try to engage in the foot voting that had been unjustly forbidden to them uh, was an important cause of the Civil War, uh, which of course eventually led to the abolition of slavery and to a tra the transformation of the federal system uh, in many different ways. Uh, the Civil War was not the, by any means the end of African American involvement in foot voting. Uh, obviously, in the aftermath of the Civil War, after Reconstruction, uh, the Southern states adopted Jim Crow segregation policies and other oppressive measures targeting African Americans. And many African Americans responded to this by, in fact, voting with their feet for Northern and Western states, uh, where policies were relatively more favorable uh, in what might be called the first great migration from the 1890s to around 1920. Some one million out of the total, about 10 million uh, Southern blacks migrated to the North and the West. Uh, this not only greatly benefited the migrants themselves, who on the whole ended up in a better position, but it ended up significantly transforming American politics over time by creating a significant black voting population in areas and states where they were allowed to vote. Uh, from around 1940 and 1960, there was the second and even larger great migration of African Americans to the North, which also had a big political impact, and eventually, of course, an impact on the federal system uh, through the ways in which it helped uh, precipitate civil rights legislation uh, by the federal government. Uh, this pattern of persecuted minorities trying to vote with their feet and 
bettering their lot in that way is not unique to African Americans or for that matter to Mormons uh, in the 19th century. There are a number of other examples, not all of which I can review here, uh, but I will mention uh, the more recent example of gays and lesbians migrating to states uh, and localities that were more favorable to them, uh, which was certainly uh, a major trend from, say, the, in the 50s and 60s uh, and onwards uh, and helped precipitate the rise of same-sex marriage, for example, in uh, more tolerant areas and eventually spreading to the entire country. Uh, if you look at foot voting today, it certainly continues on a substantial scale. Uh, if, you see, if you look at the patterns involved there, uh, people tend to be moving towards areas uh, with relatively lower housing costs, with more job opportunities and lower taxes. This is actually one of the reasons why southwestern states, including Utah, have been gaining population relative to other parts of the country. Ironically, uh, whereas historically African Americans tended to move away from the South uh, to the North in search of greater tolerance, in recent decades there's been a somewhat of a reverse migration back to the South uh, because the Southern states, many of them have uh, cheaper housing and uh, more open labor markets, which is attractive to uh, often to the poor and the lower middle class. Uh, but while foot voting, I think, has uh, continued to create important benefits, there are significant modern obstacles to foot voting that have arisen, particularly over the last several decades. Uh, one is, of course, the growth of federal power, which increasingly occupies more issues, leaving fewer available to be uh, subject to freedom of choice by foot voting. Another is that the states have become more dependent on federal government funding. Uh, they now get about a third of their uh, budgets from the federal government, which to some extent diminishes their incentive to compete. It also leads to somewhat greater standardization of state policies uh, because most of the, nearly all of these federal funds have conditions attached to them requiring the uh, states to adopt the policies that the federal government wants. Uh, the states themselves and often localities have also imposed some significant obstacles on mobility. Probably the biggest one is restrictive zoning, where in many major cities, particularly those on the uh, two coasts, uh, there have zoning restrictions which make it difficult or almost impossible to build new housing. As a result, the price of housing has skyrocketed in these areas, and they've effectively walked out many millions of people who might otherwise migrate there, seek out job opportunities and housing. Uh, the effect of this, according to a recent study by the National Bureau of Economic Research is to reduce our GDP by as much as 9% uh, because people end up being trapped in areas where they're less productive or even where there are few or no uh, job opportunities. A similar effect is imposed by state licensing restrictions where we now live in a world where some 30% of Americans uh, have to have licenses to do their jobs, and that includes in some states even such uh, not, a, not, so, not as exalted professions like interior decorator, florist, and even tour guide. Uh, and often the licensing restrictions are quite onerous. You have to take many months of expensive classes and the like, uh, and that makes it harder for people to move to states where their labor is more in demand. It also, of course, raises prices for the people, who, the other consumers who live in those states. Uh, so as a result, in part of zoning, licensing, and similar policies, over the last several decades, unfortunately, we have diminished interstate mobility uh, for the poor and the lower middle class compared to earlier periods in American history. Some of this is the result, actually, of beneficial factors. Uh, very few Americans today are as desperate uh, as, say, African Americans in the Jim Crow South were 100 years ago, uh, but some of it is the result of these pernicious policy constraints, uh, which we would do well to uh, try to address. Uh, so overall, foot voting has had a big impact on the development of American federalism. It has turned out to be actually one of the most beneficial aspects of the American federal system, even though not really one intended uh, by the founders. However, in recent years, uh, some significant problems and obstacles have arisen, uh, and I hope we can find ways to diminish them. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Soman, Dr. Sorensen, Director Smith. That was excellent. We have, um, this panel goes till 12.15, so we've got some ample time for questions.
Um, I want to remind you before we get into the questions that um, at 12.40, our keynote speaker, Dr. Nicholas Cole, will speak at the luncheon. For those of you that have been invited to that luncheon, it's in the ground floor of the library where the stained glass is. Um, I will also mention, for those of you who want to see it but have not been invited, it will be live streamed in this room um, at 12, actually 1, 1 p.m. is when the live stream will start, okay? So um, you'll be able to uh, hear Dr. Cole and his charming British accent if you come in here at 1 p.m. Yeah, Nicholas is laughing. Anglophilia is a terrible thing, I know, but um, some of us are afflicted with it. Um, let's see, what, the one last announcement. The third panel, The Future of Federalism, will begin at 2.15. Uh, it will be here, okay? So, um, that having been said, who has a question? Representative Nelson? Uh, you're talking about talking about federalism and the demise of federalism. I think we can hear you. I can, I can just ask the question. So, um, referring back to the Mormons, you referred to the Mormons. Uh, by uh, edict of the governor in Missouri, the Mormons were expelled. The Mormons went to the federal government, to President Van Buren, seeking uh, restitution. And, and Van Buren made the statement, I can do nothing for you. The federal government can't help you. Your problem is with Missouri. Was, uh, and the Mormons have vilified President Van Buren for generations because of that statement. Was President Van Buren correct that under existing federalism notions, the federal government could do nothing to help the Mormons? Uh, so he may well have been correct to a significant extent in that one of the flaws of the original pre-Civil War Constitution was that it had very few safeguards against abusive and oppressive policies by state governments. There were a few, like the Contracts Clause, uh, but there was not much in the way of uh, available federal safeguards against things like slavery, of course, practiced in the southern states, or in this case, violence or persecution of a, an unpopular religious minority. Uh, so. I'm not familiar with all the details of all that happened in Missouri in, in that instance, so it's possible there were some things that the federal government could do, uh, but on the main issue of state persecution of a religious minority, uh, it probably was not in a much better position to fix that uh, than it was to address the, the even more severe uh, oppression that was involved in slavery at the state level. Uh, so uh, what was available, uh, at least to people who are not slaves, was the ability to try to vote with your feet elsewhere, which of course the Mormons eventually took advantage of. Uh, with the Reconstruction Amendments, there were, I think, for very good reason, enacted various safeguards against uh, state persecution of various minorities, both racial and also religious as well, but as of the 1830s, that wasn't the case. I I, I might add just a little to that, that uh, uh, under, uh, Madison would have uh, believed that there was power in the federal government in a couple of ways, not just the, the First <laughs> Amendment, but he did consider uh, the right of religious conscience to be the most sacred of all property and the government taking that property created real problems for him. What about incorporation with the states? Uh, first of all, in the uh, debates over the Bill of Rights, he argued for an amendment to make it clear that the states were limited and were limited, among other things, by the Privileges and Immunities Clause that they, that these rights were in some respects immune from federal law. Unfortunately, as in so many other areas, we didn't look to what Madison might have said on that topic because the, govern the government, state or any, taking the most sacred of all property from an individual 
vexed him more than any other thing. So I, I don't want to go too much deeply into this, but I think Madison, while he would have liked the state to be constrained by the Bill of Rights on this at the time, was didn't prevail. That uh, it's significant that the First Amendment, the Bill of Rights, generally were usually thought until the Civil War to apply only to the federal government. Session is the federal government could not have an established church, but states could. Similarly, the federal government could not restrict the free exercise of religion, but by implication, the states could. And in this instance. Uh, Missouri and perhaps other states did. Uh, so it would, it would have been better, I think, if the original Constitution had been structured the way Madison had wanted it to be on these issues, but sadly it was not. Thank you. Uh, just, just a quick note on that. that, that, that up to Barron versus Baltimore, that, that, that issue in many respects has really not been decided. And then Marshall, under pressure, and probably in part because of his views, doesn't permit those kind that doesn't recognize a means for that doesn't recognize that those rights are protected against all government. So uh, there, there's an argument that could be made for that they backed away from that, and so it's more open than many historians would like you to believe. Dr. Peterson. Um, just a kind of a footnote to this. Some of the more sophisticated uh, constitutional writings by abolitionists uh, tried to utilize without success, but it's an interesting argument, the guarantee of Republican government clause, which you know, I'm sure the Mormons have been no more successful than the abolitionists were with it. But uh, that's just kind of an interesting thing. Yeah. So I, 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 that's absolutely true. Uh, and if you interpret the guarantee clause from an originalist point of view, I think this argument almost certainly doesn't work because if people had thought at the time of the founding that the guarantee clause was incompatible with slavery, for example, much less with, uh, and, and with established churches and the like, it, it would not have been ratified. If you want to adopt a, a non-originalist approach to it, uh, uh, which I think some of the abolitionists in, in some ways did, then, you know, then the argument is stronger. Uh, even so, there's, I think, some slippage on the question, well, what really counts as a Republican government, uh, you know, as opposed to a Democratic government, which words we use interchangeably today, but weren't necessarily interchangeable in the 18th century. Well, James Wilson used them interchangeably. Yeah, I said weren't necessarily right. interchangeable, <laughs> but some people did use them interchangeably even in the 1780s uh, and 90s, so uh, a lot depends on uh, whether you try to interpret this as it was originally understood versus as it could potentially uh, be understood. The Bill of Rights, of course, doesn't explicitly say that it applies only to the federal government, for the most part at least. Uh, but that was the background understanding that people had at, at, at the time, at least that was the dominant view. Interestingly, in the territories, the Bill of Rights applied virtually to all law because there was no state government. So right. Mormons were able yeah, to bring a, right. a First Amendment claim in the territory of Utah hmm. uh, that probably wouldn't have existed in a state at that time. Yes, that's right. It, 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 one, one quick point, because Ray's this, and it's it sort of been co-opted and become this kind of conservative notion of how you interpret the Constitution. If you can't go back, you go back and you say, what about this particular, and might they have ratified, and so forth. And I think it gets back to Representative Ivory's question the last session. I think you have to look at the broader principles that they felt that they were putting into motion and those principles, including I could make the case on, on, on slavery, some of what happened in the convention and elsewhere. But I think things like the guarantee clause and the privileges and immunities and what was going on, that they felt that the, the, the momentum towards liberty was such that it could, that, that it would it would continue. Now that's it, it, so. It's a different. It, that, that was the difference between Marshall. That's a Marshall way of interpreting the Constitution. You defer to the majority if you can't find a particular instance where it was dealt with in the past. The Madisonian would be take a look at the principle and see how it applies to the present. 
Thank you. Representative Ivory? Yeah, I'm seeing a great intersection between the three topics you all introduced. Uh, thank you for the St. George Tucker quote. I wasn't familiar with that one. Um, the land issue. You talk about voting with your feet, and in Utah, 90% of the people live on 1% of the land. It's the most urbanized state in the United States with a, with a tremendous land mass and yet you know, the housing affordability issues. And so in bringing that up, I mean, we had Florida, we speaking with Professor Sorensen earlier, did a resolution that they were the worst off of all the Western states because the, because the federal government at one time controlled 90% of their land. And so with this idea of vital principles and interposition, voting with your feet, and this land issue erod eroding federalism, what do you think are the most cogent arguments today based on structure, based on vital principles that, that a state of Utah, we have people from Arizona here as well, make where this is structurally eroding the very balance of federalism? What are the best arguments that we make from this historical context to, uh, to interpose, if you will? I guess it depends on what the relevant this is. Is the relevant this that the federal government owns a lot of the land in the western states, or is it something else? Well, yeah, yes, correct. I mean, in Utah, it's 67 percent. In Arizona, it's, it's, it's north of 50 percent. Nevada, it's 85 percent. And then that has the impact on self-determination, but then even voting with your feet, right? Sure. Where, yeah. where so, 90 percent of our people have to crowd into 1 percent of the land, it, it diminishes that laboratory. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of areas where uh, the tax original meaning and History of the Constitution suggests that the federal government really has overreached a lot in terms of regulation, spending, and lots of other things. In the area of land ownership, I think it's tougher to make that argument because uh, the original Constitution does give Congress the power to dispose of federal land and property, and there's no constraint in the Constitution on the amount of land that the federal government can own in a given state. As a matter of policy, I think it might be a good, many people have argued this, it might be a good idea to either privatize some of the federally owned land or turn it over to states and localities. Uh, but I don't think uh, the Constitution constrains the amount of land that the federal government is allowed to own. It may constrain what the federal government can do in terms of trying to regulate private or state activity in areas adjoining that land, which is, I know, a big issue in, in the Western states. But in terms of the actual land ownership by the federal government, sadly, there's, there, I think there's very little con constitutional constraint on that. Yeah, if I may, I mean, I, don't, I think that President Nadelson did an article on, on retention, federal retention of land, but a power to dispose, not being a power to retain when you look at the enclave clause, but the Western states have the exact same enabling act statement terms that the federal government would dispose of the land. So would that not raise an equal protection fundamental fairness argument in, in that interpretation? If we have the exact same terms of statehood, why is Illinois 1% federal land when it was 90 at one point in Utah State itself? So I hate to be in the position of arguing for federal power, which is rarely what I do, but in this area, <laughs> I, I almost have to in that uh, I think equal footing, having the states on equal footing does not require that the federal government own only the same percentage of land in each state. It just means that the general uh, rights and powers of these states and the federal government be the same, uh, but the same power can be uh, exercised differently depending on uh, various characteristics, including how much land the federal government has chosen to retain. It's been a while since I've read that art article by Professor Naderson. Maybe he is right that the power to dispose does not mean a power to retain, but uh, my initial impulse is to be a little bit skeptical of that in that it seems to me that if you have a power to dispose of a federal land uh, because you own the land, then generally speaking, the land that you own is also land that you're allowed to retain. I see like three arguments that can be made. One's an equal sovereignty argument, one's equal footing, and one's sort of like a contract claim of statehood. I think all of them face really tough uphill battles in courts. I think equal sovereignty is this doctrine that's relatively new. It was born in this context of a case that a lot of people don't like, and I think it's just not going to go anywhere. Equal footing is a more embedded constitutional principle that I think the boundaries of what equal footing is, like Professor Soman says, is it's not... You know, it's not clear that the, that requires state, uh, the federal government to dispose of X amount of land and retain Y. And the contract uh, um, claim, you mentioned that states equal, uh, territories enter the union on, on equal terms. Uh, part of my project is to look at the different conditions placed on territories as part of the statehood process. They're very different. 
uh, and certain states have much stronger conditions or harsher conditions placed on them. Um, and I don't know if anyone's ever challenged that as it, in itself as unconstitutional, but it is a fact of history. Uh, Western states uh, have these state trust land retentions. You, one of, part of Utah's constitution cannot be amended without approval of Congress, which is an interesting federalism question. So that, I mean, part of our history is to put different uh, conditions on statehood. I think if you look at the enabling acts east of the Rockies with respect to the land, the unappropriated lands, you'll find that they're in all material respects the same. For all the, all the western states, yeah. The, the western and the eastern states. So the language for Utah and Arizona's enabling acts actually came from Louisiana. We have time for about could, one more, one more could, question. Could I just very quickly, that I, I think you also make an error in looking just at disposing and retention and taking on, I would take more of a Madisonian approach and I would use interposition in the form of trying to get states together to make the argument for why it would further liberty to, uh, to find a means of federal dis disposing of the lands. It would force, it would, it would recalibrate federalism, but there are other things. Very quickly, here's, Madison had the solution to slavery. They had, they had the Louisiana Purchase. So now you could take those lands, sell the lands, purchase the slaves, and the slaves could also then go west. The problem with that was the black codes and so forth ultimately prohibit the blacks from moving there, and that's why the colonization society moves to saying, well, we'll recolonize to Africa. But the theory was we'd sell these lands, we could further liberate, we could free the slaves, they would have a place, we would give them some of those lands, we would still, it would help sort of the liberty, the manifest kind of destiny kinds of arguments, and that would be a way that you could deal with it. So I would suggest you think about an interposition by getting together and making the case and persuading. Persuasion still has a place in politics. Okay, I'm gonna try to get Tracy Gordon, who's one of our afternoon panelists here in, and maybe Robert Nadelson, since his work has been mentioned. So I think there's really two questions there. One is the question about, well, maybe there's not really a problem with fiscal discipline uh, because the federal grants are really just telling the states to provide a cert or incentivizing the state to provide a service that the federal government wants. Uh, the second is the question about coercion. Uh, the first one I think is less complicated than the second, so I'll take the first one first. Uh, on, on the, it is true that nearly all federal grants to state governments have associated conditions of various kinds. However, most if not all of them are also for things that the state government would itself want to do. In the practice matter, most of them are in the areas of healthcare, education, and uh, transportation and the like, and therefore uh, it does diminish budgetary uh, and fiscal pressures on state governments, and of course state governments are heavily involved in lobbying for many of these grants, and they often are able to persuade Congress to shape them in ways that they want. So 
Uh, very few of these state grants involve things which uh, the federal government wants done, uh, and all or most of the state just have no desire to do it all, but for, you know, they got paid to do it. So but as not a pro the level the federal government Yeah, so, so the, 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 there is, of course, uh, often disagreement about exactly how much to do it or what way it should be structured and the like. Nonetheless, to the extent that many of these things, most of them are things that the states do want to do, uh, the fact that there's federal funding for them uh, does significantly diminish fiscal discipline, doesn't limit it entirely. The U.S. is not like some other federal systems like uh, Mexico or whatnot where states get this vast proportion of their budget from the uh, federal government. There is very little fiscal discipline at all. On the second question about coercion, I've actually written about this uh, somewhat. My general view on this is that the Supreme Court's doctrine that says that conditions to state grants are okay so long as they're not quote unquote coercive, I think is not the right way of going about things. The right way of going about things is to say that uh, the conditions and grants can only be to advance the general welfare, which in my view, that concept is interpreted far too broadly by the modern Supreme Court. However, unless and until uh, we return some, to something closer to the correct meaning of the general welfare, I would be reluctant to entirely get rid of the coercion principle, even though the coercion rule is flabby at the margins. I don't think it's entirely correct to say that, well, there can't be coercive because the exception of the grant is voluntary because, of course, the federal government has monopoly power in raising taxes throughout the nation uh, and uh, in using taxes raised from the states themselves uh, as a tool to pressure the states. Much, much more can be said about mm -hmm. this. There is actually a large literature on this, uh, both by myself and many other scholars. And, if we were to get into this, we could probably take up the entire rest of the day. So I realize <laughs> that's not a completely satisfactory answer, but at least should give you a sense of where I am on it on that question. Okay, so so Tracy and and Robert will have a chance to maybe respond a little bit. I'll, I'll wait. You'll wait. Okay, so wait. if you want to hear Robert's uh, response, come come to the two fifteen panel. I'm sure Tracy will have more at that panel as well. Again, the next event for those of you that are invited, twelve forty lunch. Okay, it's just the next building over. And um, for those of you that want to see the live stream, that's at 1 p.m. Thank you so much. I, I, I really learned a lot from this, these exchanges. Why don't we give our panel a hearty round of applause.